kicking things off at 10, we've got Skyfall. Bond turned 50, and people began asking awkward questions about whether he's still got what it takes. Guess what? He has. With the help of bar-raising director Sam Mendes, 007 showed everyone that still, nobody does it better. A perfect storm of anniversary fever, that Olympic appearance, and a film that knowingly straddled Bond's retro and modern wings, resulted in Skyfall becoming Britain's biggest ever box office hit. At nine, we've got Looper, in which Joseph Gordon-Levitt's killer tracked down his future self, played by frowny Bruce Willis. As if that wasn't trippy enough, Ryan Johnson's action thriller further befuddled us by changing direction entirely in its second half. It's this year's The Matrix, screamed the critics, and certainly it's been yonks since Hollywood has produced a sci-fi movie so exuberant in its blend of entertainment and head scrambling. In eighth place, it's superhero mega match time, as all of your fanboy dreams come true, with Hulk, Iron Man and friends joining forces. It took something truly special to beat The Dark Knight Rises at the box office, but Avengers Assemble's lighter-than-air mismatched Super Buddies comedy was the bigger hit, and justified Marvel's long-game approach to this comic book franchise. Next, we have a film based on a classified covert operation that only surfaced a few years ago. Director star Ben Affleck told the unlikely but true life story of the making of sci-fi epic Argo, in reality the cover for a 1979 CIA mission to rescue US diplomats from troubled Iran. An unfashionable subject was given a makeover by combining white-knuckle tension with satirical Hollywood-baiting comedy. A dark horse for Oscar glory? Quite possibly. Up next is The Dark Knight Rises, 2012's most anticipated blockbuster. Christopher Nolan concluded his Batman trilogy with an operatic, apocalyptic, IMAX-sized epic as Tom Hardy's Bane put Bruce Wayne on the back foot. Rises finally lifted the curse of the superhero threequel as Nolan's reinvention of the genre achieved a massively satisfying conclusion, provided you could understand what Bane was saying, of course. At five, it's shame, with Steve McQueen sending Michael Fassbender on a long, dark Manhattan night of the soul. The arrival of sister Carey Mulligan sparked a downward spiral of joyless rutting, existential embarrassment, and bravura tracking shots. Following 2008's Hunger, shame confirmed Fassbender and McQueen as probably the finest actor-director combo in British cinema. Unfortunately, the sight of Fassbender's manhood proved too much for the Academy, who thwarted a much-deserved Oscar nomination. Printing straight into fourth place is The Raid. If you put money on the year's finest action movie being made in Indonesia and directed by a Welshman, well done you. As for the rest of us, we were too busy picking our jaws off the floor at The Raid's oh my god, how did he do that fight scenes. The film introduced a new star, martial artist Iko Uwais and kick-started an unlikely renaissance for action movies set in tower blocks. We're looking at you, Dread. We're up to the top three now, and scooping third place is The Cabin in the Woods, which saw Drew Goddard and Joss Whedon deconstructing the rules of horror in head-scratching fashion by revealing why so many naive young kids are prepared to unleash hell in a rural retreat. The twists mounted up from the first scene until the entire genre had been turned inside out. Simply put, you'll never watch a traditional horror film in the same way again. Just missing out on the top spot is The Imposter, Bart Layton's ingenious documentary about titular fraud Frédéric Bourdin, a Frenchman who pretended to be missing Texan teenager Nicholas Barclay despite not looking or sounding anything like him. By interviewing everyone involved, Layton made a fiendishly intricate thriller whose layers of twist and counter-twist were enthralling and disturbing in equal measure. And Total Film's best film of 2012 is... The Master. In terms of anticipation, Paul Thomas Anderson's first film since There Will Be Blood was the art house equivalent of The Dark Knight Rises. The tale of drifter Joaquin Phoenix, taken in by cult leader Philip Seymour Hoffman, was so good that the Venice Film Festival jury was barred from giving it best film because it had already won too much. And now it's won our top accolade too.